Charlie, thank you for that wonderful, warm uh, introduction. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. It was uh, 30 degrees when I left uh, New Jersey. And um, I, I did call my wife, and she told me I can't stay. <laughs> you know, 2,500 years ago, uh, Aeschylus was a playwright. He wrote a play called Prometheus Unbound. In describing Prometheus' gift, his gift to mankind, he coined a term philanthropus, meaning a humanity-loving character. Prometheus gave two things to man. He gave fire, symbolizing knowledge. And he gave optimism, or in other words, blind hope. Hope is a powerful word. I'm reminded of the African proverb that goes, he who has health has hope. And he who has hope has everything. For those of us concerned about health, this is a time of tremendous upheaval and change, a time of tremendous challenge, a time of tremendous opportunity for those of us who are looking to improve health and health care in Florida and in the nation as a whole. So let's look at some of those challenges. Next week, uh, sequestration will kick in unless our elected leaders in Washington find a solution that has so far eluded them. But in, in D.C., one of the things that they recognize is that the, one of the big drivers of the deficit is the cost of health care. And you've heard this whole line before. The United States has the most expensive health care in the world by a lot. I would also argue that the United States has the best medical science in the world. And let me say that again. The United States has the best medical science in the world. But do we have the best health? In fact, do we even have the best health care? The Commonwealth Fund compared the United States to Australia, Canada, Germany, Netherlands, New Zealand, and Britain. And here's what they found about health and health care in the United States. Compared to those countries, we were last in life expectancy. Now, you might suggest, since people will say, well, isn't life expectancy about more than just health care? And I would say absolutely, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But what they also found, and when they looked at health care and compared it to those countries, we ranked last in safe care, last in coordinated care, last in the efficiency of care, last in equity of care, and last in access of care due to cost. So what is this about us having the best medical science in the world? Well, look at it. We spend more than any other country on medical discovery. We have incredible international jewels in the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control. We have world-class health centers dotted across the country, including in Florida. And we've led the discovery of the human genome and many numerous drugs and treatments. So here's a true conundrum. The best medical science but yet our health care system rates so poorly. A paradox. William Gibson, who's a, one of my favorite science fiction authors, coined a phrase. He said, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So we have the best medical science in the world, but it's not very evenly distributed throughout our population. Now, Orlando plays a very important role in my family's history. In 1922, my father was six years old when they moved from Washington, Georgia, here to Orlando. He grew up here. He went to school here. His first job was picking oranges in the groves. And then he went off to the Second World War to be a merchant marine. My uncle still lives here. So I feel somewhat connected to Orlando. So I was looking to explain this paradox I went to the county health rankings, and you could look at it too at countyhealthrankings.org or 
Uh, at each one of your tables, there's a little sheet. There'll be a test afterwards, so I would advise that you take it and, uh, and study it very closely. And if you look at that, it compares Orange County. And Orange County performs in the top quarter of counties within the state of Florida. And the first section talks about deaths and illnesses. And in the middle, the first item there under clinical care is the number of uninsured. 25% of the people living in Orange County and 25% of the people living in Florida are uninsured. One of the highest levels in the nation. Now having insurance makes a difference. The Institute of Medicine has studied this a number of times and it's shown that people without insurance are less likely to get prenatal care, more likely to have poor health, and tend to have worse outcomes from cancer, primarily because it's diagnosed later and in a more, at a higher stage. Health insurance is important. It's important even if you don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's important. It's important if you have Medicaid. And many people have doubted that. But there was an interesting thing that happened in Oregon in 2008. They decided they were going to expand Medicaid and they sent out applications. 90,000 people applied for this Medicaid expansion. These are childless adults. But they only had funding for 10,000. So what do you do? Well, he said, they can't fund everybody, so they had a lottery. Now, what's a lottery? It's a randomized control trial. And we funded Kate Baker and others to do a study to compare the 10,000 who, who won the lottery and another group of 35,000 of the people who didn't. And what did we find? People who had Medicaid had better physical health reported, better reported mental health, better compliance with recommended preventive care, and reduced financial strain. In other words, they didn't have to forego paying other bills or going into debt in order to pay for medical care. Health insurance makes a difference. It's something that people worry about. It's something that I worry about. I worry about it because my son, who's 26 years old, his name is Robbie, and he has an inherited pre-existing condition. It would be next to impossible for him to buy insurance in the individual market. He finished school two years ago. He's working as a musician, and as you probably know, musicians don't make a lot of money. And he turns 26 this year. In 2010, right when he finished school, the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. And, a, and began a period of dramatic change within health and health care in this country. But I call it Robbie Care. Because immediately upon graduation, after the law passed, he was able to be covered on my health insurance. Otherwise, upon graduation, he would have been without. And in January, he will be enrolled in the New York State Health Insurance Marketplace, formerly called an exchange. Without the Affordable Care Act, he wouldn't have had insurance. He wouldn't have insurance now. And if he got sick, he would be out of luck. So the Affordable Care Act has a very basic structure to it. And the basic structure of it is, around 2006 and 2007, there was a, a sort of a consensus across the country. There was concerns about some of the practices of insurance companies. And what were the insurance companies they were doing? They were doing what you had to do if you wanted to provide insurance. You wanted to keep the rates down. But the practices that concerned people was, is that not everybody, like my son, would be able to get insurance or get insurance at an affordable rate. There was no guaranteed issue. There were annual limits and lifetime limits. And many of you may not realize your programs have that because you don't buy your own insurance. Your company buys your insurance. And they negotiate with the insurance company and say, OK, we want to pay this much. And they say, OK, we can cover that, but you have to have this. So if you want to pay this, you have that. And one of those that's were lifetime limits. <clears throat> or uh, in, if you're in the individual market, a penalty for pre-existing conditions. So if you were to change all that, that would mean that somebody could be in the insurance marketplace and say, oh, I just got a bad diagnosis. Now I'm going to sign up for insurance. 
because it's guaranteed to be issued. So the only way these changes, these reforms in the insurance marketplace can work is if everybody participates. So you're kind of following me down this slope. So the next step was you had to have an individual mandate. But if you have an individual mandate, there are people who can't afford insurance. So the next step down this slope is then now you have to have subsidies. And that's where the major cost of the Affordable Care Act comes in. So the Affordable Care Act, once it came in, found immediately political and legal challenges. But in 2012, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld the individual mandate and upheld the law. <clears throat> it was a little bit of a surprise, though, because they also said that the Medicaid expansion was now going to be voluntary. So what's happened? 26 states will have a federal insurance marketplace or exchange. And it's not clear yet what that's going to look like. But it certainly has the potential to be disruptive in the insurance market. 17 states will run their own in, in insurance exchange. And 22 states have declared they're going to set up their own, I'm sorry, 17 states will run their own insurance exchange. Now, 22 states have declared that they will participate in the Medicaid expansion. I'm sorry, actually, this is where I had to change my notes after last night. 23 states. And, and, and as is, is occurring in many other states across the country, there's, there's this warring that's going on as the political maneuvering. Because politics and political positions are one thing, but reality is another. There was an article in the Miami Herald just on Tuesday, two days ago, and it was an article about the Hospitals Association position on the expansion of Medicaid. And in there, they quoted the head of the Department of Health who said that it will cost the state of Florida $3 billion over 10 years to do the Medicaid expansion. And those are about the same estimates that we've seen nationally. But the Hospital Association says that hospitals in Florida spend $2.8 billion, not in 10 years, but in one year, providing care to the uninsured. It seems to me it was a no-brainer, and certainly for Governor Scott, it appears that he also thought it was a no-brainer. And he took a very courageous step to do that. And you and your state are to be congratulated. Over 1.2 million Floridians will now be eligible for Medicaid because of this change. But all of this is getting pretty complicated. It's, it's even hard for me to keep this straight, and I live and breathe this stuff. We now have state Medicaid and the federal health insurance marketplaces. Now they, they used to be called exchanges. The subsidy for the health insurance marketplace, so people are going to get subsidies for the federal insurance exchange here in Florida. They're going to get Medicaid, which is a state program and different kinds of eligibility. There's a small business marketplace for insurance. There's employer insurance. And if you aren't getting confused, you probably haven't been listening to me. <laughs> but what about a family with one child who's currently on the current Medicaid program? And then their second child's on the CHIP program, and they themselves don't have health insurance. How are they going to figure this out? There's a real role for philanthropy here for helping people figure out this mess and getting those eligible enrolled. Our foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, the New York State Health Foundation, and other regional philanthropies will be committing resources over the next years to do just that, help people get enrolled in health insurance. And that is something I think all of, those, all of you in this room believe is important to do. So look back on your sheet now. Look under the area of uninsured. And you will see the number of primary care physicians. Florida only has half the number of primary care physicians recommended as a national standard. So with 30 million Americans becoming eligible for newly in, new insurance, who's going to take care of them? And how will they take care of them? Well, one thing is, is that medical schools have increased their enrollment. In fact, they've increased their enrollment by 30%. But how many of those new students will go into primary care? And even if they do, 
four years of medical school, three at the minimum years of residency, we're already to 2020 before that, those individuals enter the workforce. So we need to provide care with our onboard workforce, and that means using our current workforce differently. Two of the Sapphire, actually three of the Sapphire Award winners are notable in how they're using the workforce differently. St. Vincent, Womankind, and the Community Smiles, providing primary care to communities that don't normally have access. So if we're going to provide the care that's needed for newly enrolled Americans, it means that the old paradigms have to change. And that means by using each, ed each health care professional to the full extent of their education and training. That's why we supported, our foundation supported the Institute of Medicine study on the future of nursing, and why we're supporting coalitions in every state in the union, including Florida, with Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation helping to take the lead in action coalitions to implement those recommendations. This is a time for all hands on deck. Doctors, nurses, physicians assistants, pharmacists, all healthcare professionals doing the things that they're educated and trained to do unrestricted by 20th century scope of practice laws. David Rockefeller, who founded the Rockefeller Foundation, said that philanthropy is involved with basic innovations that transform society not simply maintaining the status quo. To prove, improve healthcare, transformation is needed. This healthcare system is fragmented. A recent study that we funded by the Dartmouth Atlas found that one in eight Medicare patients are readmitted within 30 days after surgery. One in six return after a medical discharge. And when we looked at it and compared 2008 to 2010, there was no difference. It hadn't gotten better. We have a payment system that pays for volume and not for quality. The Affordable Care Act has provisions that enable us to change, in fact, will force us to change the way the care system is, that provides support for medical homes, that establishes more integrated care through accountable care organizations, and begins to change the incentives from pain for volume to pain towards quality, and a focus on penalties if care transitions are, handed, are handled poorly. You know, we funded a major academic health center in this country, which will remain nameless, to do a study on these care transitions. They looked at their own discharges. And over a period of one month, they looked at every one of their discharges, and not a single one didn't have an error. There were errors or the medications were reconciled, so the medications the patient left with weren't the medications they were supposed to be taking. The discharge instructions weren't clear or firm appointments weren't made. Now, none of these caused harm, but they could have. Now, not all re readmissions can be avoided, but we can do a lot better, and we have to do a lot better if we're going to be able to afford the care in this country. And philanthropy can play a role in improving health care quality. Let me just tell you two stories. The first one is a program that we sponsored called Expecting Success. This program was designed based upon the analysis that there are a lot of hospitals that serve a predominantly poor or minority population. And they have very thin margins. They can't afford to hire these high-powered consultants to come in and help train them in how to do quality improvement. So we worked with 10 hospitals, and we said, okay, we're gonna provide those consultants to you. We're gonna give you that technical assistance. And we focused in on one thing, cardiac care, and looked at time from when a patient comes in with chest pain to when they actually get the balloon to treat their, their heart attack. We provide the technical assistance to these poorly performing hospitals, and every single one of them got better. There are things that we can do and they don't cost a lot of money to help the institutions that are struggling because they don't have the resources to get the kinds of assistance that they need. Now, I trained in emergency medicine, as you heard, on the south side of Chicago almost 40 years ago. But there are some things that haven't changed very much. In that day, we had what we called our regulars. 
there was Eric who had a sickle cell, and he came in the emergency department so much I watched his kids grow, grow up through the pictures. And then there was Anton who had asthma, and he was in every week, and Mary who had diabetes who was in once or twice a week. This was a problem that existed then, and this is a problem that exists now. But Dr. Jeffrey Brenner was concerned that the cost of care got in the way of expanding the services to the poor in Camden, New Jersey. And what he did is he used data. He developed the maps, and he used these maps, what's called hotspotting. And my congratulations to Dr. Hart, who's gotten, a, who's gotten a Sapphire Award for doing work very similar to what Jeffrey Brenner had done in Camden. One of these patients that he looked at was a patient that had gone to the hospital 113 times in one year. So what he did is he looked at the data and he found that there were two buildings in Camden, New Jersey that resulted in $30 million in one year of health care costs. So using care teams to do house calls and to coordinate care, they began to say, can we change the care and the cost equation? Let me just tell you one of the stories that he shared. He went in, he saw a patient, they saw a patient in his home. And they said, okay, show us how you take your insulin. And this is a guy who had been in 113 times. And the guy said, okay. He put the bottle of insulin on the table. He took out his needle, he stuck it in the bottle, and he withdrew. And then he gave himself an injection. Now all you medical people in the room know that when you put the bottle down, the air is at the top, and you put the needle in, all you're going to get is air. He was wondering why he never seemed to run out of insulin. And the hospital was wondering why he kept on showing up in the emergency department. Just this simple in innovation enabled them to reduce costs on these high-cost individuals by 40 to 50 percent. And they had better care and had more enjoyable lives. These are just a few stories. But we can create so many more by philanthropy discovering these innovators and these innovations, refining them and sharing them. I remind you what David Rockefeller said. Philanthropy is involved with basic innovations that transform society, not simply maintaining the status quo. But true innovation will come by looking at the big picture and then looking at it in a different way. You know, there's an old medical parable. It's about a surgeon who's walking by a river, and she hears some shouting. So she runs to the river. She sees a man drowning. She reaches in and pulls him out, does CPR, brings him back to life, gets up very satisfied with herself, and then she hears shouting again in the river. She goes there, and this time it's a woman. She drags the woman out, she does CPR, she brings her alive. She's starting to get a little bit tired, and she hears another shout. This time it's a kid. She runs and jumps in and brings the kid out, does CPR, all the time thinking, I wish I had time to go up river and find out what's wrong with that bridge that people are falling into this river. In healthcare, we get so focused on caring for those in front of us that we never seem to have time to address the health concerns of the community, to go upstream. In 1900, the leading causes of death were pneumonia, tuberculosis, and dysentery. Life expectancy in this country was just 49 years and we only spent 5% of our gross domestic product on health care. When you look at the charts of the time from 1900 to 1950, it's fascinating when you look at a disease like tuberculosis. The reduction in the rates of death to tuberculosis dropped 60% between 1900 and 1950. And I point out 1950 because that's when we started using antibiotics to treat tuberculosis. It was nutrition and it was sanitation that caused this dramatic reduction in death due to tuberculosis. By 1960, life expectancy in this country had increased to 65, one of the largest increases in life expectancy since man decided that saber-toothed tigers didn't make real good pets. The leading causes of death were heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And in 1960, we only spent 5% of our gross domestic product on health care. Since then, we became enamored of the marvels of modern medicine. 
you know, these antibiotics came on the scene, it seemed like just a bullet would treat everything. But we hadn't recognized that the causes of death had shifted from infectious agents to tobacco, to what we ate, to how well we exercise, and to conditions where we live, learn, work, and play. So take another look at that sheet that I handed out. And look at the bottom of the sheet to be able to explain the problems that you see at the top of the sheet in mortality and premature death. And you'll see that Florida has less access to recreational facilities and more access to unhealthy foods and limited access to healthy ones. Philanthropy can play a role there. Helping poor communities build parks and recreational facilities. Supporting organizations like we did, the Food Trust in, in, um, in Philadelphia, which has now expanded to other cities, where they go in and they create the capital so that grocers can come into inner cities. In fact, the groceries that they built in Philadelphia, in poor inner city communities, are the top grossing stores for the change that they convinced to move into those communities. We face the challenges of our time, of care that has become too costly, too fragmented, and too focused on care rather than prevention. This is a time with many challenges, but also a time of great opportunity. Opportunity to help literally hundreds of thousands of Floridians newly eligible to get health insurance. The opportunity to lead the way in using our workforce in new ways to, that gives, allows everyone to use the skills that they have to help redesign the delivery system to in improve quality while reducing costs, and to improve the social factors that determine health where Floridians live, learn, work, and play. We must make the most of these opportunities, mobilize philanthropic innovation to work with private and public sector resources in, in the brains and the minds of the people who are represented in this room, partnering with innovators like the Sapphire Award winners and other dedicated people who are in this room because they care and they can make a difference. In the words of Oliver Cromwell, we must strike while the iron is hot, but strike and strike again to keep it hot. Yes, we have the best medical science in the world, but working together, we can also have the best health in the world, here in Florida and across the nation. Again, thank you for inviting me to be here and congratulations to the Sapphire Award honorees.